my experience of school. How long have we got? Okay. Um, short answer would be very negative. Very, very, very negative. Um, I struggled all the way. I was undiagnosed until I was 23. Um, You're really bright, intelligent, no learning. Yeah, no, no learning differences, anything like that. Um, the, the other way, in fact, I was hyperlexic. I could read them right before I went to school. Um, um, I read Lord of the Rings when I was seven. Um, so very, very intelligent, very advanced. Um, and my needs were not identified or met at all. Um, you were just sort uh, of the shy boy. Yeah, I was uh, looking back retrospectively, I would have been diagnosed as selective mute. Um, there were days where I didn't speak at all. Um, I withdrew quite a lot. Um, and in the same at home as well. Um, you know, the people talk about the, 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 the Coke bottle analogy of autistic children that mask that go to school, they get shaken up all day and they explode at home. I didn't explode at home either. I kept it in um, 24 hours a day. That, even yeah. when we met. And um, so school was a huge struggle for me. I, I was surrounded by the same kind of peer group from infant, from reception all the way through really until I was kind of 17. Um, and if you'd asked me at the time, I would have told you that they were my friends, but they weren't my friends. Really, I know now what a friend is, and then they weren't my friends. They were just people that I went to school with, and it's kind of, um, it was a really difficult time for me. And at the age of fourteen, I, sh because I think I'd been suppressing everything and struggling so much, um, through my teens, I was on and off antidepressants. You know, just why you would give a 12 year old antidepressants I don't know and it's and at the age of 14 I tried to kill myself with an overdose um but didn't tell anybody um I somehow woke up the next morning and felt very ill but didn't tell anybody just said told my mum that I felt sick and I was going back to bed and that was it I took a few days off school and then I went back to school and then everything carried on exactly the same nothing changed and it wasn't it wasn't that I wanted to die it was that I wanted to step out of the environment that I was in I needed a I needed it to change and the only way that I could see that I could do that was to switch it off um, and then then you somehow made it to college yeah I made it to well, six, sixth, sixth form. form I stayed on it stupidly I stayed on at the sixth form school and I think that's because it was the environment that I knew um, and I lasted for about nine months and walked out and never went back um, and it just became too much um, in terms of sensory issues and um, you know, being being surrounded by people constantly, and it was a big comprehensive. It was nearly two thousand kids at the comp, so it was kind of in the sixth form. So it was just too much for me. Um, the school system did not work for me at all. It was, if I wrote about this in my blog a couple of months ago about what my school life was like, and I described my perfect school, and um, how I would have been better educated, and it was that if you had put me at a table next to a waterfall, a little waterfall or a stream, um, pond with fish in it, um, something like that, something where I could just sit and look at the water and if you had led me by my interests rather than forcing me to learn things in a way that I couldn't keep up with, and, you know, I, I'm hugely competent at maths but I struggled with maths all the way through school and that was because when the age of 10 I hit fractions, couldn't understand fractions, it was never explained to me in a way that I could understand and my mind crunched and I couldn't do maths after that. Um, and nobody engaged with me, nobody saw that I was struggling with that, nobody correlated the fact that this was a child that was amazing at maths and then all of a sudden wasn't. Nobody ever looked at that and it was kind of, and I look back and I wonder how on earth any of my teachers didn't recognize that there was something going on with me. But, but obviously was, this is a hugely common story. I'd say we've got about 30 years mm -hmm. and it's just, you know, kids weren't getting diagnosed at three four Obviously, very yeah. rarely and back it was then and... and it was no it was well not at all really and it was it was only people with comorbid learning differences and things that would have been diagnosed as autistic back then and, and it's it's kind of it was never recognized um so no i struggled hugely with the education system um if you asked me to go back to school now i wouldn't go back it was it was a torturous experience for me i hated every single second of it you know, it's a really hard sending Quinn and Libby out to school every day. And yeah. like, are they happy? Are they okay? Are they managing? And Libby really struggled when she started reception. 
she really and now she's much more settled and she knows it and she knows like the physical area she knows that you know she can write and she can read and she doesn't have to you know be boisterous and, mm -hmm. and do things but it's the hardest thing in the world sending it out but you know she's loved and she's cared for and people accept her and Quinn for who they are and make these small allowances that seem to make yeah. a difference. Yeah, and I think that's, you know, if I was, if, 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 I, if I could get the education secretary down in a room and pin him down for a couple of days and, um, her down, sorry, and, um, and talk to her about how schools and the education system should be supporting autistic children, you know, it's, Masking is such an important thing to recognise and it's something that teachers don't recognise at all. They see a child that gets on with their work, they're quiet, they do what they want and they do what they're told and then they go home again and masking is such an issue for autistic people that we at a very early age recognise that we're different from other people and recognise that different isn't good. We're told that different is not good, you should not be different. Look at that fat person, they shouldn't be eating so much. And you know, it's such a negative culture that we have of shaming people for being not as the way that society perceives that we should be. Um, and masking harms us. With autistic people have an early death rate. That's 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 common knowledge now. It's it's something that's been recorded and investigated and researched. Um, the average age that we die on on range is between is between mid thirties and mid fifties, and that's because and our biggest killers are suicide and heart attacks, and that's stress and anxiety. And that anxiety isn't because we're autistic. It's anxiety because we're forced to hide who we are, and we spend. It's exhausting. I would come home from school even after we met and I moved up here. I would come home from work. And I collapse in a heap, literally collapse in a heap because I was so exhausted. And and but people don't recognise that, people don't see that. You know, they see a child that comes home and, you know, they're tired, they're irritable and they maybe melt down, they maybe, you know, they they, they behave and they get told off for it. And so you pull know, so always yeah, you, you know, like you have to work harder, you have to do this and, and then we get you know, it ends up being like school refusers and things like that and it and it's why does it ever be allowed to get to that stage? I don't understand that. And it's, you know, and it's parents, I think, quite often struggle to recognise this because this isn't, these aren't things that are talked about. Masking is not something that, autist, that parents of autistic children are ever told about anywhere by any Even, professional. Livy's it's, just little, she's five and starting to go through her diagnosis and she's got the most beautiful teachers who love her so much. And when they've observed her and, you know, they they want to say to us, but there's nothing wrong with her. Well, no, there's nothing wrong with her. There's nothing wrong with her at all. But she's, 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 she's different and it's not wrong to accept that she's different she and recognise that. She and... is diff all she draws is cat pictures. All she plays is cats. You know, she can't, she can't do the normal like mummies and daddies. She is different, but difference, difference, okay. But I think hopefully... We're lucky that we've got schools that are yeah, and I, and I've that. I've kind of explained this, but especially with Queen's Junior School, the head teacher there, Paul Dixon, the head teacher is amazing, and you know I've talked to him about this and my experiences, and that this isn't an experience that I want to be repeated, and it's it's not me putting things on Quinn, you know, I'm not expecting that Quinn's going to go to school, and his experience of school is going to be the same as mine, but I don't want anybody's experience to be the same as mine. And you look around and parents that I talk to, and I'm sure parents that you talk to, talk about the horrific times that their children are having at school. And what does that say? That school is not the environment that they should be in. And, but yet they're forced to go. There is no other way of doing this. And it's that we have to fit into this narrow, rigid um, idea of what we should be doing. You know, we, we at the age of five, we go to school and then we go to senior school and then we do our GCSEs and then we do our A-levels or go on vocational training and then we get a job and then we get married and have babies and our whole life is pinned down between the age of zero and 30. Um, and if you've made it to 30 and you haven't done any part of those things, then you perceive as a failure in some respects. And it's, you know, what pressure to put on people anyway, but what pressure to put on an autistic person that can't survive in an environment like that and can't live in that system and this is why we as autistic advocates talk quite a lot about how 
society impacts on us that autism isn't a disability that we are disabled by a society that doesn't accept us and um, if we are allowed to live in the way that we are and we're supported to be who we can be you know amazing things happen but that isn't the way yeah, that Quinn, it works Quinn said to us when, when he goes to concert academy at his next school he said the other week mummy he said uh, will the academy be my last school and I said well not necessarily I said there's a sixth form there which you, know, you have to go to now, um, but it's up to him if you want to go to university. And he said, oh, university. So ben goes to university. He said, yeah, I, I'm going to go to university. I said, oh, well, that's good. He said, uh, but I'm going to live with you. I, I'll go to university. I'll come home and I'll live with you. Well, that's absolutely fine. You know, and that, if that's where we get him to, and that's what he does. But, you know, I'm so, it, in a lot of ways, I'm so glad that the kids are grown up now because there's so many opportunities and, the boys do like a lot of other kids they want to be youtubers um yeah but that technology is starting to exist and it means that you know there are opportunities now that mean they don't have to go and wear the suit and be in an office that i think there's no. there's new opportunities coming up and if we can encourage you know the kids to take advantage of that then then fun you know fantastic and so, especially i think um with like the confusion amongst like dot around diagnosis and around the labels around diagnosis you know people who are given a diagnosis of asperger's they're expected to go off and be you know computer technicians and things like that and it doesn't work like that we're all very different people and that we have all these perceived notions of who people are and what they should be doing and we, it's kind of everybody has to put everybody in some kind of box yeah. <laughs> and they're on the lower end of the spectrum therefore are they thick or are they in the higher end of the spectrum and therefore and for us it's just and autistic. well that that that's it and that whole Isn't that it? whole thing about functioning labels and things and you know some of you know i wrote a blog um that was entitled um uh i'm i'm aspergic autistic low functioning high functioning and severe you know it, it's because i am all, all those at any given time i could be any of those things and any autistic person can be any of those things which is why I think there's a lot of confusion, you know, there's so much expectation put on people who are diagnosed as high functioning or people that are diagnosed Asperger's and the expectation is that, you know, you've got, you've got mild autism, you know, so you can get on with it, you can go into this and you know, actually in ways I am impeded and as a high functioning supposedly person, I'm impeded more in some ways than someone with a diagnosis of low functioning autism and and someone with and the opposite so it's it, it is about that societal shift that needs to happen and the yeah. way that people look at things it's not quite about education but kieran's always works we've been together 18 years so once kieran moved up here from essex he worked in the schools and worked for local government but only ever worked part-time so even a school environment you know was nine or three and he had half term and summer holidays so effectively for Kieran part time then went into more office work and it was three days a week and sort of they were a little bit shorter days um, and Kieran needed that so he always worked he always earned but it had to be part time and now I understand why that he could work and he got on with his colleagues and he had a good time but he needed that time it needed to be a limited amount of time but then it was always well, Kieran's the man of the family, so why isn't he working full time? Why are you the one bringing in all of the money? And that's not very fair on on you. And it was like, well, there's not a problem with it. We're happy, it's you know. That it is. But that 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 enables. And then Kieran was a stay at home dad when Libby was born, and you know the raised eyebrows and the it it just so wash. Just let us get on with it. And as long as as long as we're happy, it really it doesn't matter a job but then Kieran always got oh well you're not autistic you don't look autistic you're 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 fine and, it, it... and that's the thing I mean I can sit here and talk to you and if you I know that you understand how autism works because of what you do and who you work for but and if you took an average person on the on, off the street and plonked them on that chair they wouldn't see me as autistic at all they don't see what goes on in here and what goes through my head and the, the process that it takes me even to get the words out to talk to you. I mean, I will finish this interview with you and I probably won't speak for the rest of the day. 
and it's except I'm taking you out for pizza. Well, but I'll st- yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll be sitting that. with Quinn looking over his shoulder at his tablet. I think, <laughs> <laughs> but you know, so so it's and that's that's not a negative thing. I accept that that's how it is, and I put myself through these things because I need to get that message out. I have a need inside me for other people to understand what's going on. Thank you.